Very often in machinery, we want to drive one shaft at exactly the same speed as another. When the shafts turn round in bearings in the frame of a machine, there's no problem. Gears can easily be used, or for that matter, chains, or belts, or possibly other devices. But when the shafts alter their relative position during normal operation, then the problem is much more complicated because there's no suitable fixed frame in which to locate the elements that transmit the drive. The transmission elements must be supported by the shafts themselves. Then they constitute a shaft coupling, which for uniform speed transmission is by common usage called a constant velocity shaft coupling. A well-known example where uniform speed has to be transmitted fairly accurately is between the steadily rotating gearbox output in a car and the hopefully steadily driven rear wheels. Because the rear axle is on springs, there's some uncertainty about its position relative to the gearbox. Usually there's a multiple coupling in the form of two universal joints and a spline. But to transmit drive to the front wheels is another matter altogether. Because as well as the suspension movement, the steering through perhaps 40 degrees either way in each wheel must be allowed for. Simple universal joints cannot be used because they do not transmit sufficiently uniform speed. I'm not just going to describe constant velocity shaft couplings, but to relate them to a new general theory which establishes the necessary and sufficient conditions that have to be met by any coupling designed to transmit drive exactly uniformly from one shaft to another. Take first the common universal joint. This one is from a vehicle transmission. And here's a small one, essentially just the same. It consists of two hinges at right angles to one another, joining a central cross piece to yoke pieces at either end that are themselves attached to the two shafts. And here's a cardboard model which has just the same kinematics and more easily demonstrates its behavior. The two hinges are now simply folds in the cardboard. And the cross piece is now just a flat piece of cardboard or a plane. The coupling constrains the shafts to intersect at its center and the shafts have two degrees of freedom relative to one another. Rotation about one hinge and rotation about the other. When the shafts are in line, they always rotate at exactly the same speed, but when they're angled to one another, the speed ratio is no longer always equal to one. It fluctuates through two cycles in each revolution, and the greater the angle, the greater the speed fluctuation, and the more the wobble in the central plane. Because this plane wobbles, it is not a plane of symmetry. The theory shows that there must be a plane of symmetry that never wobbles at all if a coupling is to transmit exactly uniform speed between the shafts without any fluctuation whatever. As an introduction to constant velocity couplings with exact symmetry, here's a cardboard tripod standing on the mirror and looking like two tripods joined together at their feet. However the tripod stands, it's always symmetrical with its reflection. And the axes of the two shafts, one attached to each tripod, must always meet at a point in the plane of the mirror, at the geometrical center of the coupling. The theory, incidentally, establishes that for a single coupling to transmit uniform speed, the shafts must intersect at this point. The tripod is, of course, self-supporting. When positions are chosen for the three feet, then, as every photographer knows, a tripod is uniquely positioned. But it does not stand in a unique position on only two feet. Yet it may have more than three. Any feet over and above the minimum of three merely flopping down on the mirror and joining up with their reflections. The tripod may even be very distorted, but its reflection is always exactly symmetrical with it, and a deformed tripod like this, when joined to its reflection, creates a constant velocity shaft coupling. And here is one. The tripod legs are slightly crooked triangles, but the shafts always intersect at the geometrical center of the coupling in the plane of the three tips of the triangles. The coupling can plunge or telescope in and out. And this may be a useful property. However, if you don't want plunging, you can put a ball cup joint to the geometrical center or impose some other positional constraint and so eliminate the plunging. 
This one's based on a tripod too, but designed so that there's a remarkable amount of plunging within quite a small overall diameter. It works even when the shafts are at full right angle to one another, but when angled as far round as this, there isn't much scope left for plunging. One always seems to lose plunging as one gains angularity. These cardboard models are of course no good in real engineering, but they do show the movements that you can get with proper hardware. The tip of a tripod leg corresponds with the center of a ball cup joint, which is often used as an engineering component. Here's a coupling designed at the University of Sydney by Arthur Sherwood and Jack Phillips, consisting of three ball cup joints on hinged arms in the tripod and reflection form. Although this one is quite new, it's closely related geometrically to many known couplings used, for instance, in front wheel car drives, where the balls run in tracks. Their basic kinematics, too, derive from the reflected tripod because a pair of crossed symmetrical tracks keep the ball in the plane of symmetry just like two symmetrical pivoted arms do for a centre of a ball cup joint. Here now are a few front wheel drive couplings. First, one used in several British Motor Corporation cars, the Burfield coupling. There are six balls in symmetrical tracks, corresponding to a six-leg tripod, as it were, and this is what the tracks look like. Another one, named after Weiss, one of the very earliest that was ever designed in the 1920s, has four balls between left and right-hand tracks. Unlike the Burfield, this one can plunge. There are other couplings differing in some details, some of much larger size, for rolling mills for instance, all using balls and tracks. One can also use two universal joints placed close in series with one another with a central symmetry preserving device concealed inside, which succeeds in bisecting the angle between the shafts very nearly accurately but not quite. This kind of coupling is very sturdy and sensible for front wheel car drives but it's not absolutely 100% precise. Each reflected tripod connecting chain has five degrees of freedom. There are three degrees of rotary freedom at a ball cup joint and one rotary freedom at each hinge. These five freedoms can be identified in the ball in track equivalents too. About a century ago, Clements in the USA patented a coupling based on two of these chains. He needed a central ball cup for constraint and symmetry because he didn't use three connecting chains, but only two. This cardboard model demonstrates the Clements principle. One can modify this coupling, as I think Clements himself actually spotted, by suppressing one of the three rotary freedoms of the ball cup and replacing it by two carefully placed hinges. Now, when this design is tripled up, you get the recently made UniTrue coupling manufactured by Southwestern Industries in California. This particular UniTrue model, which is a bit spidery and intended only for small torques, transmits uniform drive through a full right angle. It was designed for precision purposes with almost zero backlash. As I turn, you can judge from the dials that the transmission is uniform. But this is rather a special non-plunging coupling. If we look at the single connecting chain again, we can, without any restriction of freedoms, imagine the three rotary freedoms of the ball cup joint to be provided by three non-coplanar intersecting hinges. However, a plane of symmetry can still remain, even when these three hinges do not intersect at a single point. This connecting chain has the required five degrees of freedom in its five hinges that do not intersect at all. Their axes, as it happens, are all arranged at right angles to their neighbors, and all the proportions of the chain are symmetrical about the central hinge axis. So this form of connecting chain can be used multiply to form a coupling, and here's a model of one with three connecting chains. You can see the symmetry. The coupling always constrains the shafts to intersect at the geometrical center, and it transmits uniform drive with plunging. Next, the theory reveals that there are many other ways of disposing these five freedoms in each connecting chain. For instance, the hinges needn't be successively at right angles, so long as one side is always symmetrical with the other side. 
One can even replace simple hinges with symmetrically disposed screw nut joints. One might make use of joints that have two degrees of freedom. For instance, joints permitting rotation as well as axial translation, usually called cylindrical joints. But symmetry remains an essential ingredient. Also, the general theory alerts one to other inadmissible or unfavorable proportions or unsuitable forms of joint. So there's an enormous range appearing of different geometrical possibilities for constant velocity couplings. But we haven't by a long way rung all the changes on the original reflected tripod connecting chain. The ball cup can be larger and there's no need to use the whole of the spherical surfaces. The centre of the ball can be as far away as we please in the, in the plane of symmetry. Eventually, when it's infinitely far away, we are left with flattened pieces of spherical surface which are just like two plates rubbing together or a brass in brass sandwich. Three parallel hinges connected in series allow the same relative motion and are probably more attractive to a designer than a brass in brass sandwich kind of joint. Here's a symmetrical coupling using three parallel hinges instead of a ball cup joint. It's tripled up and transmits uniform speed between angled shafts as expected. But as it turns out, the theory has been stretched too far. Look what happens when the shafts are in line. The coupling is now quite unable to constrain them to intersect at the geometrical center. It has all become slack. Now we find that the shafts can freely move apart parallel with one another. And when they are apart, the coupling works between parallel shafts, again transmitting uniform speed ratio, and then the coupling maintains the shafts parallel to one another while still allowing plunging. This is perhaps rather unexpected. The coupling constrains the shafts to remain angled to one another, and then, if they are moved through the inline position and out again, it constrains them to remain parallel to one another. The shafts cannot go directly from an angled position to a parallel position. They have to go through this configuration of uncertain constraint when they're in line in order to get from the angled to the parallel configuration. When we apply the theory, this curious behavior can be explained fairly simply. And thence we learn how to get over the problem and how to make the coupling work as a properly constrained parallel shaft coupling. Let me try to explain. When the shafts are in line, there's a plane of symmetry across the middle of the coupling. But two parallel shafts do not intersect, except at infinity. If then there is to be a plane of symmetry, and if this plane of symmetry has to pass through the point where the shafts intersect, any plane of symmetry in a parallel shaft coupling must somehow be imagined at infinity, not anywhere in the finitely accessible region. This then is the root of the trouble. When the shafts are in line, the coupling of itself cannot, as it were, distinguish between the plane of symmetry here, across the middle, and the other imagined plane of symmetry at infinity. For the coupling to work properly, we must resolve this dilemma. And we can resolve it, if we want a parallel shaft coupling, simply by removing any local symmetry and at the same time unambiguously establishing an imagined plane of symmetry at infinity. This we can do by altering the settings of the mounting blocks so that each connecting chain is tipped over. When I have reset all three connecting chains, no local symmetry remains. And give or take a little looseness in the joints, the shafts cannot angle with respect to one another, but they are free to shift parallel with one another, and at all times they are constrained to remain parallel. They are still plunging. This demonstration model is primitive. It shows up the geometrical principles, but it's not a real engineering design. In parallel shaft couplings, just as for the others, there's a wide range of possible joint replacements, again consistent with the general theory. We can replace hinges with screw nut joints, 
or even with cylindrical joints that permit sliding and turning. So long as the required parallelisms remain, and so long as there are five degrees of freedom in each connecting chain. The theory of screw systems reveals many variations and, as before, identifies situations that must be avoided to ensure proper functioning. At the present time, there are, I believe, only two commercially available parallel shaft couplings. The Oldham, and the Schmidt. Both non-plunging. Naturally enough, both of these comply with the general theory. Now, however, the theory reveals dozens or even hundreds of promising plunging geometries, all entirely new. But of course, to convert any one of these geometries into a realistic engineering design requires a detailed knowledge of the particular situation. There's no problem in any of the new couplings about balancing them, statically and dynamically, either perfectly or very nearly perfectly. Power couplings, particularly in automotive transmissions, seem to be quite well covered by existing rugged and compact shaft intersecting couplings that transmit uniform speed adequately precisely. But in precision engineering of one kind or other, there could be some applications for new couplings included in this wide range of newly revealed possibilities. The theory dictates absolutely firmly that there are no simpler forms of exact coupling. It is perhaps illuminating in these days of ever more complicated analytical techniques that a general theory for constant velocity shaft couplings has materialized from pure screw system geometry unaided by any algebra or other form of analysis. The success in this small area of design has reinforced my belief that basic kinematic geometry can probably be applied systematically in other engineering fields too and open up other potential designs. I am convinced that kinematic geometry deserves to be appreciated and more energetically pursued by more engineers.